Today, on the continent of Africa, nearly 30 million people have the AIDS virus, including 3 million children under the age of 15. There are whole countries in Africa where more than one-third of the adult population carries the infection. More than 4 million require immediate drug treatment. And to meet a severe and urgent crisis abroad tonight, I propose the Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, a work of mercy beyond all current international efforts to help the people of Africa. This comprehensive plan will prevent 7 million new AIDS infections, treat at least 2 million people with life-extending drugs, and provide humane care for millions of people suffering from AIDS and for children orphaned by AIDS. Welcome to Global Health Insights, a podcast from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. I'm Rhonda Stewart. In this episode, we're going to look at PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Established by President George W. Bush in 2003, PEPFAR provides funding for AIDS treatment and education programs across Africa, into Asia, and the Americas. In its two decades, PEPFAR has received more than $100 billion of funding and is credited with saving more than 25 million lives. Traditionally funded on a five-year cycle, it was not reauthorized in September 2023, leaving PEPFAR with just one year's financial support. Today, we're going to examine the future of PEPFAR and the impact of moving from a five-year funding cycle to a 12-month cycle. Joining us today is one of the architects of PEPFAR, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Dr. Fauci is former director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and was a leading AIDS researcher in the early 1980s. A government scientist under seven presidents, he was asked by President George W. Bush to travel to Africa in 2002 to assess how the United States might support the continent in its fight against AIDS. We're also joined by Dr. Angela Apiege, a health economist and assistant professor in the Department of Health Metrics Sciences at the University of Washington and co-lead of IHME's Development Assistance for Health Resource Tracking Team. Welcome to you both. Thank Dr. you. Thank Dr. you. Dr. It's good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Fauci, let me start with you with a question on the history of PEPFAR. Take us back to what was happening with HIV AIDS in the early 2000s and describe for us the kinds of things that you saw in Africa when President Bush sent you to the continent leading up to the establishment of PEPFAR. Well, it was a critical time around the year 2000 because in 1996, with the introduction of the protease inhibitors into the triple combinations, that we used in the developed world, there was a transformational change in saving the lives of persons with HIV, where we were for the first time able to get the level of virus to below detectable, but durably suppressed for an indefinite period of time that completely turned around the lives of persons living with HIV. And from 1996 up to around 2000, Everything changed in the developed world where, the, where the, the drugs were available. It became very clear to many of us, myself included, but I was not alone in that, that the people in the Southern Africa and in the Caribbean were very much in the same boat as we were in the early 80s, where we had no drugs at all and our patients were essentially dying right in front of us with very little that we could do except treating the opportunistic infections, which in many respects was futile because if you don't suppress the virus, sooner or later, the opportunistic diseases are gonna kill the patient. So when I went to Africa multiple times, I was deeply struck by my African colleagues in the year 1999, 2000, 2001, were in many respects in the same boat as I was in the 80s, in that their patients were infected. But it isn't that there were no drugs that were available. It was that they didn't have accessibility to the drugs. So at that point, it became clear that we needed to do some program. We weren't sure what it was, but some program that could bring prevention, treatment, and care 
mostly to Southern Africa, but also to some of the Caribbean countries. And it was in that context that President Bush, who felt very, very strongly, in fact, the words he used to me were, we have a moral obligation as a rich country to make sure that people do not die and suffer from a preventable and treatable disease merely because of where they happen to have been born. And he sent me to Africa and said, put together a program that's both transformational and accountable, and let's see if we can make it work. And that's exactly what I did. I came back after uh, multiple trips, and in 2002, with the help of several members of the White House staff, I put together multiple versions of the program until we finally decided at the end of 2002 to have a $15 billion program that would be over five years to prevent 7 million infections, treat 2 million people, and care for 10 million people, including AIDS often. As you well know, the president announced this on January 28th of 2003 in the State of the Union address. Seldom has history offered a greater opportunity to do so much for so many. Fast forward 20 years, we've now spent over $100 billion and saved 25 million lives. So that's really the way it started back when we realized there was something that we could do in Southern Africa. And so in addition to the lives saved, tell us a little bit about some of PEPFAR's other accomplishments. Has it in fact been a transformational program and how so? Well, it's been totally transformational because besides the lives that were saved, 5.5 million babies over that period of time were born AIDS free, who otherwise would have been born literally from birth living with HIV. And there have been tens of millions of people who have called under the care of the structure that was set up with PEPFAR. So I think if you look historically, that this is the most impactful public health program for a single disease, literally in the history of public health. Dr. PJ, let me bring you into the conversation and ask, given the accomplishments that Dr. Fauci has mentioned, why hasn't this problem been fixed? We are now 20 years into PEPFAR. So why has this problem not been fixed? Well, the, the problem PEPFAR is trying to fix uh, is indeed a very complex one, one that involves multiple uh, stakeholders. Uh, but however, progress has been made. Uh, Dr. Fauci just highlighted the tremendous progress that has been made uh, by the program. In addition to that, uh, to put things in context, it is helpful to remember that contrary to popular belief, the proportion of the federal budget, inclusive of mandatory spending, that goes to foreign programs is less than 1%. If, if we believe health globally is important, then we must do more. We we are at a critical juncture in the fight against HIV AIDS. And it's important that the gains that have been made uh, are sustained. And a, a question to you both. So as Dr. Ifeje mentioned, development assistance for health from the United States is a relatively small proportion of the US budget, despite what some may believe, but continued financial investment is still necessary to address this crisis and many others around the world. So why is it that the US public and the global community should continue to invest in fighting HIV AIDS? Well, when you have metaphorically a war that we are fighting with HIV, even though you've been winning a number of battles and are turning the tide, you can't stop until you've solved the problem. So. We are still in the middle of an AIDS pandemic. Uh, we've been in it for now more than 40 years, and there's a tendency on the part of the general public when they become used to something, they don't feel it is impellingly important 
to continue to put a major effort to counter it. And I'm afraid that many people throughout the world, including in the United States, feel that, well, we've done very well with HIV globally, so now we can pull back on the intensity of the effort, which is absolutely counterproduction productive to the solution. In fact, it just came out yesterday that a re-examination in the Republic of South Africa that 27% of pregnant women are living with HIV. That is a phenomenally unacceptable number. <laughs> so the idea about pulling back on PEPFAR and authorizing it only for one year instead of five years or pulling back on the appropriations not only does not make any sense, but will allow us to lose ground that we have gained over the past many years. You know, we celebrated the 20th anniversary so of PEPFAR just Thank a few months ago. We don't want to revert back to the way things were before PEPFAR, which is entirely possible if we don't put a full effort into essentially containing it much, much better than we are right now. And to President Bush and Mrs. Bush, thank you for what you did from the outset and your continued leadership today. History is still calling us to seize the opportunity to do so much for so many. So let's finish the fight together. Bottom line is much has been accomplished, but much still needs to be done. And let's talk about where partners fit into the picture as we consider PEPFAR and how the program can be made sustainable. So where do we go next in terms of ownership and leadership of the program? I think in order to secure the gains that have already been made, uh, it's critical that the leadership of uh, PEPFAR partner with all the key stakeholders in developing a sustainable transition plan the good news is that sustainability is an issue that has been on the radar of uh, PEPFAR leadership. Uh, just thinking of this in three aspects, uh, program sustainability, ensuring that activities are able to continue long after, financial sustainability, encouraging domestic governments to take up more of the financing uh, of the HIV uh, AIDS program as well as political sustainability, ensuring that there's a political commitment to make sure that the resources and attention that is needed to uh, bring an end to the HIV uh, fight uh, happens. In addition to that, uh, the examples, uh, global examples uh, that PEPFAR could learn some lessons from if needed in terms of uh, ensuring that there's a sustainable uh, transition plan. Uh, we could look at the example of uh, Gavi, the Western Alliance uh, related to immunization and see what insights could be learned from that experience. I think good planning uh, and the flexibility with that plan will be critical in ensuring that the gains that PEPFAR has made uh, is preserved and sustained for the long run. And as we also think about partnerships with respect to African countries and Africa CDC, for example, these are of course not the only important stakeholders who would benefit from greater partnership and ownership of PEPFAR. What are some of the other important voices in this conversation regarding PEPFAR? I well, believe, go ahead. Go ahead, Angela. Go ahead. I, I would say that the voices of those most impacted uh, here, the youth, uh, because that's uh, one of the key areas where we are still seeing uh, high new infection rates, uh, men and women and children living uh, with HIV AIDS are key constituencies that must be engaged fully. Uh, in any dialogue related to developing policies and making sure that the, their concerns are fully addressed going forward. You know, the, we, you've mentioned it, but I, I want to underscore it, is that 
the leadership in each of the individual countries that have benefited from PEPFAR absolutely need to take a very proactive role in being part of the solution in their own country. I mean, PEPFAR, when you look back when we first started it, some countries had to rely completely on PEPFAR because they didn't mm -hmm. have the infrastructure, the resources, or the capability. Other countries actually already had a head start, but needed the additional resources that were provided by PEPFAR. Gradually, you want the individual countries to take more and more of the responsibility. Not that you want to give up giving resources from PEPFAR, but you want to see more and more what we call the self-sustainability of the program. And, and I think it's to the benefit of obviously of every individual country, both from a public health and an economic standpoint, as well as a national security standpoint, to be very much invested in partnering with the PEPFAR program. So I would say that country leadership has to play a major role in that. And then there are organizations, World Bank, International Monetary Fund, and others who have a stake in the economic stability of different countries. You know, one of the biggest detriment to economic stability is a country that's racked with HIV. And we know that from experience over the years now. Well, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Ikeje, thank you both for taking time to discuss this critical issue as we consider how the United States might, might best continue to support the fight against HIV AIDS across Africa and throughout the world. Thanks again. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank, thank you very much. Good to be with you. Thanks, Angela. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you, yeah. thank you Dr. Bauchi. Take care.